All right, you know deep down you came to watch me tear apart this week's dynamite. You know you did. And that's why you've either A, already smashed that subscribe button on previous videos, or B, you're finding yourself drawn magnetically to do so now. And you should. You absolutely should. And you should follow the show on Twitter. So that way when I watch Dynamite each week and I tweet about the show, you can follow along and have some fun. And you can agree with me. Or you can rage against me. And that could be fun too for all of us. Just like this review, because you know deep down some of you really enjoyed this show because you have no standards or I don't know what. So then you'll go with your flaming keyboard fingers of fire into the comments section and you will rage away. And I welcome that too. But man, oh man. One of the biggest concerns I had about AEW, and I've probably talked about it before, I'm sure I have, so I'm being a little bit of Pete the Repeat Perry here. Uh, but one of the biggest concerns I had about this company and its formation was there's a big difference between doing spot shows and doing spot shows that are very uh, match focused and very spot focused and wrestling focused versus having to develop and create and mold wrestling on a weekly television basis and being able to develop characters and create build up for characters and momentum for characters and emotional investment for characters and the stories that they're involved with. And when I look at some of the people in charge of AEW, it was a significant concern for me at the time that they started. And that concern has really not gone away. Like a lot of this show absolutely sucked. And it didn't just suck because it was just like suck really, really bad. It just sucked like really bland and boring and off the mark. Like you look at the opening match. At least it won the tag match. Positive. So we're going to try to take some positives out of it too. But Pac versus Eddie Kingston. I mean, technically there's a story here, but really, truly, does it make any fucking sense? Does anybody really care? Is this helping either one of these guys? And I think, again, part of the problem is, is these guys don't get consistently featured in a week out, week out basis. So it feels like you're always trying to play catch up or let me guess, you got to sit there and go to the internet to find out what the hell is going on. You got to go to YouTube and you got to, no, you don't. It's your job when you're putting together this show each week to inform and educate the fans, however you do that. Um, so yeah, I mean, there is a story, but it seems like it's schizophrenic all over the place and we don't know what the hell's going on. And you could say with Miro and Chuck Taylor, like that story at least has had some bills for a little bit. So that makes sense. But if Chuck Taylor loses, he becomes Miro's butler. Like who's signing up for that? Who wants to see that? Why would anybody think that that's a good utilization for a member of the best friends? More importantly, who in the hell would think that this is a good initial introduction and utilization of Nero? Like, yeah, he largely squashed Chuck Taylor here. So you largely did the match the way you should. But again, this is the way you bring in Miro. You make him Kip Sabian's best man. Like, who the hell is that? Why would anybody care the hell about Kip Sabian? So now you're just making people not care about Miro. Like, that's really dumb. I like the spin that Matt Hardy has taken. So like they're doing some good things and they're trying some good things. And I will at least give this company the benefit of the doubt that it seems like they're willing to try different things. That is very true. But this Matt Hardy like heelish turn just really feels like it came out of nowhere. And that doesn't mean it was the wrong thing to do. It doesn't mean it's a bad thing to do at all. It's just... It was like you go from everybody's worried about him because he got hurt and then all of a sudden you turn around and now he's a jerk and he's mentoring and influencing the private party. Like it's a weird turn, very sharp, quick turn to take. I'm not saying it's a bad one, especially in the current environment that they're in. I think it's a, it's a better nuance that you could, you could do with Matt Hardy's character. It just seemed like it came out of nowhere. Now, thankfully you get the inner circle segment and usually that's one of the saving graces of the show even week, every week. Even when the show is bad, you usually assume that whatever involves the inner circle is going to be pretty good. So that'll be a highlight. And when the show is good, the inner circle stuff tends to be really good or certainly better than most of the rest. And it just really helps the show be even better. Um, you got Y2J being called a tag team slut. You got the reference to Sammy Guevara and Jake Hager teaming together. Sammy Hager. Yeah, I get it. You get it. Ah, fuck you. Um, but, you know. The, the way they tease the animosity here, but then the bro ship, the friendship at the same time. Like, and just in general, these segments are fun. They don't go too long. 
They kind of get in, get over what the hell they're trying to get over, and they get the hell out. And yet still manage to build up to something for next week. Like if we got more of this on the show every week, AEW Dynamite would be a hell of a lot better than it is. And then you follow it up, and here's maybe a problem that I see. You got too many people on the roster. I've talked about this before. You also got too many factions. Like you got Inner Circle, and then you immediately follow it up with Dark Order. So you got two different large schmazes of groups of people, but they're not really feuding with each other. They're doing different things. Like you got to cut back on the talent that you feature. You got to pick and choose your spots. You got to have fewer factions. You got to do something. Now you got the Dark Order, and this is a really tough and awkward spot to be in um, because now with Brody Lee's passing, it's like, okay, what do you do with this group? How do you make it to where everything that they get is not just because it's in response to Brody's passing or it's for Brody? Because that shit's going to wear thin really, really quick. And I don't know how they do it. Um, At least they did a better job this week, I will say that. They didn't wait an hour and a half into the show to mention or feature the AEW world champion. Like, that's a positive. That's a positive. And your match this time, it was originally being set up like it was going to be Kenny Omega and the Young Bucks versus the Varsity Blondes and Danny Limelight. But instead, you get a swerve in the ring, and Don Callis announces it's going to be the Good Brothers teaming up with Kenny Omega. And i got to be honest, and I hope some of the fans will be really honest, like, this is a cringe invasion angle. A combination of a cringe and invasion. Like, this is exactly what happens when these Bullet Club nerds get together and think that they can book an invasion angle better than WWF. Well, 2001 WWF invasion angle was the absolute drizzling shits. So that's not really saying much when you say you can book a better invasion angle. But this is exactly the type of of cringe-worthy invasion angle, crossover, interpromotional crap that you would expect people that don't really value or understand how to lay out nuanced, multi-layered, multifaceted stories. This is the type of garbage that you get. You're bringing the band back together. Well, who even gives a shit? You know, it's not surprising that the viewership numbers for this show this week weren't that great. It's a reflection of crap like this. When you put your world champion in bad spots, he already shouldn't be the world champion anyways, but he is. So as long as he's going to be, then you better damn do better than what you're doing with him. This is not good. I mean, the Moxley's part coming out, you know, and him being willing to take on all three, like that looked good. That was well done. I'd rather you not even bothered having the stupid match and have him just confront everybody. Have the Good Brothers there. Have the Young Bucks there. And then have Moxley come out and confront all five of them like he's the leader of the AEW locker room. And then even though he's a lone wolf, he's a leader. And here come some other people. Like it would make for so much more interesting television than what the hell we got. You know, like introduce a little train wreck. Like you did with the waiting room. Like I love the fact that it was a, you know, one of those old school sets set up near the ring and in the you know, in the arena, like you used to have with the barber shop, the funeral parlor, etc. I liked it. Like, as soon as they said Dr. Britt Baker was getting a talk segment, I said, oh God, why, why is she getting that? And why would this be anything other than a disaster? And let's be clear, as soon as she brought out the American Nightmare, Cody Rhodes, I said, oh God, it is going to be a disaster. But thank God she pulled kind of the mini brother love gimmick and didn't let him say a fucking word. Thank you so much. Dr. Britt Baker. And instead, what we got, instead, what we got was Jade Cargill, my boo, coming out and confronting Cody's bitch ass about his wife's bitch ass, using her pregnancy as an excuse to duck. An excuse to duck. That's all it is. And she wants a fight. Yeah. So she better find an opponent. And an opponent came up and stepped up, apparently. And it's Red Velvet. So Red Velvet and Jade Cargill, we're getting physical. Excuse me for a moment.
pull it together. I'm sorry. I couldn't help it. I was thinking about Jade Carville, Cargill, excuse me. I'm all out of sorts right now. Jade Cargill messing up Red Velvet. Like, so tall and Amazonian and dominant and short, so short, petite and beautiful. Like, fuck her up, Jade. And then afterwards, give her a good game on the cheeks, on the backside. And then maybe a little kiss. Excuse me. I'm sorry about that. Got to learn how to control myself. And for those of you that are wondering, don't worry about what my right hand did. All right? All right? What I am worried about, though, is this. As we move on, before I just derail the entire review. Luchasaurus' species did not spend 65 million plus damn years evolving... Just to have Marco Stunt take his place in a tag match against FTR. Now this is a poor utilization of the talent that you have. Marco Stunt should be your AEW Women's Champion. Because you can do all types of cringe things. He could sit there and be the little smarmy fuck that you look at him and you see like he looks like a smarmy fuck. And he could do it. I guarantee he could do it. And it would get over. It would easily be the most interesting thing that this AEW women's division has ever done. Like, what would be the issue with that? How could that possibly not work? Him being a part of the Jurassic Express is stupid! It should be Jungle Boy and Luchasaurus. They don't need a third wheel. They're not a babysitter. They're not a daycare. They're a goddamn tag team. And they should be tag team champs in 2021. Ugh. So yeah, the first hour and a half of this show, or a little less than an hour and a half of this show, had a lot of bad. It got quite a bit better with the NWA Women's Championship, Tay Conti versus Serena Deeb. I saw a lot of people commenting about how Tay Conti looks like she's improved and improved a lot in the past year, and I would agree with that. Uh, certainly, I think her best match in AEW uh, Serena Deeb, it's a type of solid, <laughs> you know, women's championship level caliber match that you would expect from her. There's only really one issue or one problem with this. Is why, oh why, with as many women that you already have on the roster, are you still giving airtime to another company's women's championship? That's what I don't get. So even when they do something good, like, it just doesn't make any sense. But what did make sense was this main event. For the TNT Championship, Brian Cage, Darby Allen. Like you've spent weeks and weeks and weeks, you could argue months, building up to this. You've got a contrast in size, a contrast in styles, a kind of lone wolf in Darby Allen versus Brian Cage, part of the Team Taz machine. And, and what I loved about this is not only, when I, while I'm not a fan of the Darby Allen gimmick, and I think it's stupid. That doesn't mean that I can't recognize when you do something well with what you have. And they absolutely, absolutely have done that here. And they get you emotionally invested in Darby Allen as a babyface. And you feel like he has legitimate obstacles to overcome. You feel like you legitimately need to get behind him. And then you watch this match and you see it's not just crash test dummy shit. It's not just two guys trying to get all their crap in. You've got Brian Cage working as a big monster powerhouse when he's legitimately got a hundred plus pound advantage on Darby Allen. He's not sitting there and doing a bunch of high flyer crap. He's not doing a bunch of cruiserweight crap. He's doing the type of stuff that a heavyweight should be doing. And Darby Allen's playing off of that. And Darby Allen's doing stuff that a cruiserweight should be doing, especially with a, you know, a heavyweight or a super heavyweight. 
and Brian Cage is selling it well. Like the chemistry is there between these two. The way this match was structured, I thought was outstanding. You know, even when you get to the big peak moment, you've got Team Taz out there, and then here comes Sting, and he knocks over Ricky Starks with the old man breath. Yeah, you did the baseball bat my ass. It was the old man breath. And now you've got Sting involved, but he doesn't totally interfere. Darby Allen wins. I could sit there and rage about, should, should we be beating Brian Cage like this? Like, why couldn't we just have Brian Cage win? Uh, you know, you want to get a guy like this some wins at some point in major spots. That would be nice. But, you know, at the end of the day, what you're probably really building towards is a Darby Allen Sting tag match going up. And maybe if you throw Cody in there, perhaps it's going against Team Taz. Like, that's what you're building towards. That's what this is about. But this main event was really, really well done. So I can't sit there and rant and rave about every single thing that AEW did with the show this week. I think it's stupid that they keep featuring another company's women's championship just to introduce as more people into the schmas. But at this point, it's the best thing they've got going. And then the main event, like you look at something like that and you say, that's something that a professional wrestling company should be proud of putting out there on their show. Like they build up to it throughout the night. You have both of these characters built up. There's a story there with layers and multiple pieces and elements. The match is structured and worked in a way that it's absolutely supposed to. Now, the Meltzer Magoos of the world will sit there and certainly get to say lower star rating than the Omega Phoenix flippy flop, floppy fuck fest that didn't matter the week before. But this right here, personally, personally, Thinking about it from a standard of having characters you get invested in, having a match that actually tells a story, and a match that advances something, like a match that feels like it's worthy of a main event, this is leaps and bounds, run circle, better circles around that piece of crap last week with Omega and Phoenix. Like, I can't imagine looking at the two of them and thinking because these guys did more flips and more kicks and more high spots and false finishes, and that match wasn't even that damn long, that think in any way, shape, or form that that match even measures in co by comparison to Darby Allen and Brian Cage. Like, how the hell could you make that argument? You can't, and you know you can't. That isn't even an indictment of Kenny Omega. It's just I'm saying, like, here is a way where you could combine some of the old school elements of professional wrestling and the new school elements of professional wrestling and create a really interesting and compelling wrestling product in today's world. And if you did more of this type of stuff with a Darby Allen and a Brian Cage, you could start to watch your viewership go up. You could start to see more fans that aren't familiar with their product, fans that are new to your product, tuning in on a consistent basis. The type of stuff you put on in the main event is the type of stuff you should be putting out there as a consistent basis in your featured spots. And I promise you the fans will come. If you put some of these other meaningless, like, scramble, uh, schizophrenic fuck things that you do on these shows every week, the random six or eight man tags, like, the matches that have stories that are so stupid and they make no sense, like, you're going to get the viewership numbers that you got this week, which were not good. I mean, at least you generated a rating. I don't even know if NXT measures on the rating scale at this point. But it's, it's these things that give me hope and reason for belief in the future that it could be better for AEW. Now, the problem was it took through an hour and a half of sorting through a lot of crap in order to get there. So let me know what you thought of Dynamite this week. Flame away at me in the comments if you loved all the other stuff on the show. That's fine. Let's have some fun. And argue back and forth. And if you agreed with me, that's great too. And no matter what, you should follow the show on Twitter and subscribe to this damn channel. Click the bell, what the hell, so that way you're notified of future videos. And just remember, here at OTRS Central, it's not the wrestling show you want, just the wrestling show you need. I'm out. Did it really freeze?